little bit, but um, basically the point of today's talk is, um, like it says, uh, I don't believe you should call it continuous delivery. If you don't have a system you can go to in your organization and click a button right now and deploy to production, it's not CD. It might be really good automated build and test and what have you, but you're not quite in continuous delivery yet. But there's a trick to that. When I say that, I mean safely. Having done all the right things and, you know, et cetera, and not ended up in jail or broke or those kinds of things. So that's really the point of this talk. Um, the talk comes from a personal thing of mine where I'm probably a little bit too binary on some things. So like I'm not anymore, but I used to be a manager and my pet peeve was, hey, is this thing done? Well, yeah, but I just need to, or yes, except, you know, et cetera. No is a perfectly valid and okay answer, but done is done. <laughs> and so that's when I, when I say, if it's not CD, if you can't do it right now. So who am I? I have a very large dog. <laughs> he really does sit there. Uh, my name's Ken McGrage. I, I've been with ThoughtWorks for about 10 years. Uh, I'm currently a technology evangelist. For some reason, they pay me to do this. Uh, I go around and talk about continuous delivery and DevOps and so forth. Uh, I'm one of the global organizers for a conference series called DevOps Days, which before I got involved with it is actually where the term DevOps came from. Um, there's a DevOps Days here, Thursday and Friday, which is one of the reasons I'm in town. Um, I don't know if there's tickets available or not, but anyway. Um, I never update my blog, but there it is. You can feel free to check it out. Uh, happy to go on Twitter and so forth. One of the things I like to do before any talk is give some definitions of words. And I do this not to say, this is what the word means, this is what you have to adopt, go, go forth. <laughs> I do this so that for this talk or when you're talking to me, you know what I mean when I say these. So it's also, I think, important inside your organizations that you agree on what things mean. If you say I'm you know, doing DevOps or if I'm doing continuous delivery or if I'm running a unit test, that you all agree in your team what that means. So the first one is DevOps itself. I wrote my own definition so that you know what I mean. So when I say DevOps, I mean that it's a culture of people working together. So I'll get into this a little bit, but no such thing as a DevOps tool. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can't actually do DevOps. It's a way of working and so forth. Um, there's more about that. A little test that I actually end up doing in my head is a word substitution game. Whenever I hear somebody do it, I just I sub substitute culture. So like I'm not a big fan of the title DevOps engineer because it's that's a culture engineering. That's not a thing really. Um, so just so you know, when I say DevOps, this, that's what I mean. I mean the culture behind it, not the technology behind it. Continuous delivery, on the other hand, um, this one I'm not going to be so presumptuous to try to uh, define because they actually did it. Um, Jez Humble, who wrote, uh, co-wrote a book called Continuous Delivery with David Farley. Uh, they both worked for ThoughtWorks at the time, although now they're famous, so neither one does. Um, but that's his definition of continuous delivery. Now, the important thing to note here, and I have a new toy, so I'm going to play with it, is he said, all types safely and quickly. So it's not just your application, it's everything about the changes, the configuration, the database, everything about it, and safely. So no Wild West <laughs> and so forth. Okay. So first off, and this is probably going to be very much a review for a lot of folks here, but why do we do continuous delivery at all? So when we first started talking about continuous delivery in ThoughtWorks, um, gosh, 10 years ago, we saw it as the completion of the Agile promise, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, if you're familiar with the Agile Manifesto, uh, if there's actually a second page to it, and it's called the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. And the first principle is the highest priority is satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And so, you know, from Agile 17, 18 years ago, we said we wanted to deliver software to our customers faster and so forth, but we actually didn't. We most of the time delivered it to customer advocates or product owners or what have you, but not to customers. Um, why do that? Anybody take Agile like fundamentals courses 10 or 15 years ago? You might have seen this. You know, it turns out partially done might be useful. 
So we want to be deploying all the time so we can get feedback from customers and know, are we going down the right path? Uh, you know, they don't paint the Mona Lisa on the way at the top, they paint it the way at the bottom. Uh, it's actually, there's a couple websites out there, if you want to have some fun, go look at uh, x-rays of famous paintings and how much they changed over time. Because they, canvas was very expensive, so they didn't scrape it off. So you can go and they did x-rays and you can see how much the artist would change their mind. Security threats, these aren't going anywhere. We need to be able to react quickly. You know, when something comes out next week or next month, and not, not if, when, we need to be able to react quickly. Uh, when Heartbleed came out, this has been a couple years ago now, uh, there was a huge number of web servers affected by this OpenSSL bug, and many of them were exploitable for weeks. Some of them might still be. I wouldn't be surprised if they are. Um, anyone know the story of Knight Capital? So a couple. One of my favorite stories. Okay, good. I'll finish it at the end because it's his favorite story. Um, continuous delivery is, uh, how do I put it? It's not where you start. It's you know, more closer to an end state, although you're never really done. And so one of the things I really want to encourage people to do is consider continuous integration a prerequisite. Okay, you really do have to have all the tests. So things like you know, XP processes, like test-driven development, and good unit tests, and good coverage, and all that kind of stuff, you can't deploy to production safely and give it to your customers if you're not running all the tests. So if you're not doing CI yet, and we'll get into what I mean by that a little bit, um, don't worry about the deploying production yet. Right? You got a different problem to fix first. Or I don't even want to say problem, different work to do first. We do a publication called The Tech Radar. I think there's some over on the table over there, where we talk about a bunch of different things and what we recommend people you know, stop doing or do or what have you. One of the things that came out in the last year or so is a concept called CI theater, where people would say, yep, I'm doing CI. And we're like, OK, do you have this? No. Do you have that? No. It's like, OK, you're pretending to do CI. You're not really doing CI. And so you're really not safe. Um, a particularly disturbing study that we did inside my division in ThoughtWorks is we sent out a survey and we said, are you doing continuous delivery? Are you continuous integration, excuse me? Yes, are you doing this? Survey monkey stuff, follow up and so forth. Only 10% of the people differentiated having a product from doing the thing. They're like, yep, we're doing CI, we installed Jenkins. <laughs> doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of Ferraris running around town, doesn't make them car race car drivers. Okay, um, you actually have to do the practices. So what do we say are our litmus test, if you will, for continuous integration? Uh, this one was written by Martin Fowler and, and Jez Humble, two people who are way smarter than me. Um, so I'll believe them. First one is, and this is probably the most controversial, um, everybody commits to a shared mainline every single day. So call it trunk-based development or master or what have you. It is not long-lived branches. It's not feature branches. Um, I'm not saying you're evil. But I am going to say that if you're doing feature branches, you are not doing continuous integration, full stop. Okay. The next one down is every commit triggers automated build and test. So it's not nightly builds anymore. I'm old. I remember when our build took eight hours. Um, so it's every commit. You want fast, fast, fat feedback. Yeah. Can I ask questions now? Or do you want to sure. Daily. Oh, absolutely. Especially in today's world of distributed version control systems. Okay. Like when I do work on Git, the first thing I do is Git checkout dash b something. Okay. I just to check. Yeah, no, it's 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 mostly daily. That's that's I think what Jez and da and, and uh, Martin said was daily, but it's usually more often than that even. But I've been at customers where there's I was at one that had 26 feature branches. The youngest one was three weeks old. Oh, yeah, that's not <laughs> Yeah, let's not do that. Um, and then if build and test fails, Jez says 10 minutes, that might be a little aggressive, but it gets fixed. You don't leave it red. It's OK going red. I'll get into that towards the end. OK, but you don't leave it red. I'd rather have no test than a flaky test. OK, you really need to be able to trust your pipeline. Um, that's first. This is the continuous integrations first. Get this done. OK. so. We just said no long live feature branches. But I also said, if you can't deploy right now, you're not doing continuous delivery. 
okay, well, how do we justify that? Because features take longer than a day. So we need ways to deploy incomplete work. There's lots of different ways. I'm just going to go over a couple um, that, that have been very successful for a lot of people, including us. Um, first one is the concept of feature toggles. Who's using feature toggles or feature something like that? Okay, should be more. <laughs> but basically the idea is you're going to work on a new feature. The first thing you do is create a configuration that turns that feature off. Then you start implementing the feature. And so that feature could be half done. And if I deployed the software, it would be off. It wouldn't, that code would not get executed. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. But the idea is just this. I'm going to do a pet survey. And if it's false, then it doesn't show up. If it's true, then it does. Uh, that allows you to deploy and even release, and I'll get into the difference between those, um, even if stuff's not actually complete. Now, the blog on the bottom down there, and we'll send out these slides later, uh, Martin actually wrote in 2010. So this is not a new concept. But it was followed up last year, two years ago, by another colleague, Pete Hodgson, to go even further into some of the ways ThoughtWorks does uh, feature toggles. It, you know, toggle routers where we can use geography, that kind of information, database stuff, percentage of, of deployments, et cetera. Um, these are really, really powerful. There's even now SaaS companies that can do feature toggles as a service. So they put a little bit of code on your page and you configure their thing to say whether or not things should show up. Um, I haven't used any in personally, so I'm not going to mention any names, but toggles are a very big deal uh, in today's world where we want to deploy a lot. What's really cool about these two is that they're useful for other things. So just some examples, again, from Pete's article. Um, when we're talking about deploying, we're talking about release toggles. When we're talking about incomplete features. So those hopefully don't live very long. They're very dynamic. By the way, this is tech debt. If you're adding toggles in there, once the feature is done and accepted, you need to go back and clean it up. Okay, so the feature takes longer to do it this way. It's safer, but it is tech debt. Um, but notice some other things in there. Experiments. So if I do it this way, do my reservations go up or down? And so like A-B testing. Um, permission toggles. We're having a really bad performance outage or something. Change it so only admins can log in. Things like that. Uh, operations, same kind of thing, and so forth. Um, is Netflix big here? Streaming, OK. So Netflix is a big streaming movie thing. Um, they actually have a bunch of toggles in there. They're operations toggles for big features. So I'm streaming a movie. They have a major problem in the outage. The recommendation engine might shut down. They just shut down entire parts of the thing, but not the streaming of the movie and not the ability to sign up, because that's where their money comes from, you know, and so forth. But they'll actually shut down parts that aren't important, as important. Big shopping holidays, some e-commerce people do that. They close down all the recommendations so that the page loads faster. So you can do all those kinds of things. So very, very powerful thing. If you could only change one thing in the average place to get to continuous delivery, it ain't your tools, it ain't your technology, it's not your tech stack, it's your org structure. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by that to enable this kind of thing. So first off, um, this is a chart that shows up a lot if you look up continuous delivery. Like if you look up continuous delivery on Wikipedia, this comes up. Uh, and it's credited to Jez Humble, and it was actually created for a sales deck uh, that we did together at, at ThoughtWorks about nine years ago. And Basically, the idea here is showing you the feedback cycles of delivery team makes a commit, something fails, they fix it right away, it goes a little bit further. The idea is things to get to the right. Um, spoiler alert, because I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but the number one regret that, that David and Jez have from the continuous delivery book is that, that pipelines were always shown in a linear fashion. In fact, there's going to be a lot of things we need to do in parallel there's a lot, and so forth. Um, so it's not really quite this simple, but it's basically the idea is the feedback loop. So if we want that feedback loop, then let's look at the average organization. Now, this is going to get very hand wavy. So there's going to be team names and those kinds of things that may not exactly match, but I think that you'll, you'll get the point. And if not, tell me. But you know, a lot of organizations, you have my, your development teams. And they're the ones that write the code. And they have a code complete and so forth. And then you know, this is the old Agile chart, <laughs> almost. Um, throw it over the wall to, I just called it testing team here. But call it 
anything you want, compliance, security, what have you. Um, this is the, yeah, I'm doing continuous delivery. My pipeline gives it to security, and then they do something. I don't know what. Um, and then from them, somebody has to run it, the operations team. These poor folks have no idea what happened. Does anybody identify as an operations person? It's your job to run the stuff somebody else wrote? Sorry. That's my background, too. Pager going off at 3 a.m. to break something that I never even knew got deployed. OK, that's not exactly fair. <laughs> Um, there's a thing out here called Conway's Law. It was written 51 years ago. Um, and I know that because it was the month I was born. <laughs> anyway, um, but it basically says that your architecture is going to end up mirroring your org structure. So if you have in your org, this group does payments and this group does you know, shipping and what have you, you're going to end up with an architecture that roughly mirrors that. And when he wrote it, he was talking about uh, nuclear plants and dams, but the same actually works out true to software. The same actually works out for continuous delivery pipelines, too. If you have groups that are doing the different things, your pipelines are going to end up mirroring that. You're not really going to get your development teams the ability to deploy quickly to production. So we go back to that model. So I'm going to talk about some things that don't work for fixing this. And if you identify with one of these, please feel free to, is there fruit they can throw at me? Or, I don't know. Um, but there's patterns that, that get into why this. Things that don't work. Renaming your operations team a DevOps team <laughs> actually doesn't do anything. OK, you know, you know, may learn a little bit of Chef or Puppet or Ansible or what have you. But um, it's the communication barriers are there. The people doing the automation still don't have any idea why that feature is there and so forth. Not quite as bad, but creating another silo that does the automation for everybody else also does not typically work. So you know, if we put a DevOps team down here, and then they're going to create the pipeline that everyone else is going to use, but they don't really know the tech stack all that well. They don't really know what the support matrix is going to look like, and they don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are ways with platforms and so forth. But this also is, generally speaking, an anti-pattern. Um, Jez Humble will go on a screaming rant if you talk about that. He's like, building another silo is not a solution for silos. So what we'd rather see is this concept. You might have heard of products over projects. So product teams. So teams that have cross-functional capabilities. I don't mean everybody on there has to be a Solaris admin or you know, whatever. Um, although, I tell you, if there was a Solaris admin on Jez's team in 2006, the continuous delivery book would not exist. Because it came out of a horrific failure where they didn't know that NFS was going to do a thing. And it did. Um, so we want these kinds of teams. Anybody heard this? You build it, you run it. This is or Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, uh, in 2006. He was doing a, an interview and he said, our rule is you build it, you run it. If you're going to build the service that processes the credit cards, you're going to run the service that processes the credit cards and you're going to be the one that gets paged and so forth. People often think that they did this to pay less operations people or because they're using AWS, which, by the way, Amazon.com didn't do. <laughs> people think, you know, oh they, oh, they started selling the thing that Amazon runs on. Nope, didn't. What's funny, though, is if you take it the whole context, I don't expect you to read the whole thing. Um, what's funny, though, is the why. If we look down here, what it really was was to bring developers into the day-to-day -day operation of their software, to bring them closer to the customers. So that if they changed a feature, they would know if they sold more or less shoes. And if they sold less, they would take the feature back out. And they could see that. And they could see the performance things. And they could see that, OK, it now takes 100 milliseconds longer to process an order, which people will leave over in the aggregate. Okay? So it wasn't one team because we want to make their organization smaller. It was one team because we want fast feedback. And we want to know if what we're doing is successful. So how do I do that? Um, we often hear, well, that's great if you're doing, you know, if you're doing the Kubernetes, but that's not going to work for me. Uh, and it's possible. One of my favorite stories about this is um, Hewlett Packard, though. So Hewlett Packard, for the firmware on their printers, had a problem where well over half of their time was spent just basically setting up test stuff, not on new innovation. Because they want to make a change, but there's like 19 different drivers on 19 different printers or you know, whatever it was, and they couldn't do these. So they ended up actually having to re-architect the way the drivers work. 
And now, and of course bandwidth and disk storage and everything else is a lot cheaper, there's one piece of driver software and it just works on a bunch of different ones. And so they did continuous delivery not by doing more tests or what have you, they actually did have to re-architect their software. And in their case, they're now doing 80% innovation time. So that was the financial payback. Don't do it just to do it. Don't change your architecture just to change your architecture. Um, but there might be some. So we had a client in North America, um, travel agency, that had a really bad problem. So they had a monster monolith. And the uh, first time I talked to them, they said, yeah, we, we deploy like once a, once a week. Well, that's not all that bad. I mean, this was 2009. That's not that bad. Um, he said, yeah, but it was the build from six months ago. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's not as good then. They literally had a six-month hardening cycle. Okay, and so that's not good. But so their problem was that the services that they offer, the things that they sell, the demand for those doesn't scale e evenly. And so um, an example is, well, here in Singapore, lots of hotels. <laughs> Okay, and you can hire a car, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be that popular. But if I want to up my capacity to book hotels, I have to up my capacity to rent cars because it's all one process in a, in a, in a typical monolith. Okay, and so their problem was whenever they wanted to scale, they had to scale everything, not just the thing they wanted to. And so this was a significant cost. Again, don't change things because they're shiny. This is a significant cost. So they had to put this out on multiple servers. When we say microservices, we don't mean the buzzword. We actually mean something very specific by it. So a microservice is an independently deployable piece of software. So if you say these two things have to be deployed together, not a microservice. If you say these two things share a database, not a microservice. Okay, they're independently deployable. The advantages to that for them is what they got to do is take out that piece that was costing them the most money, the piece they couldn't scale, only that piece, they didn't decompose the whole thing, created a service for that, went to the original monolith, pointed it at the service, scaled the service up, scaled the monolith down, saved tens of thousands of dollars in hosting costs alone just because they're less infrastructure to run the monolith because they can now scale it separately. So that allows them to go now and distribute these across servers the way they need to, not the way that they're being told to do it. So lots of stuff out there on decomposing monoliths. Actually, I didn't put a reference in here, but on martinfowler.com, uh, a colleague from Central America just wrote a really good thing about decomposing monoliths. Um, this might be necessary to achieve continuous delivery in your environment. It might not, but it might be. So what does that do for us? We go back to our product teams and now they can own a part of the business. So this team is responsible for rental cars, this one's responsible for hotels, this one's responsible for airlines, you know, et cetera. So they can own it. Um, there's a model out there, I didn't do any slides on this. Um, people might have heard of SRE, Google's been talking about it, system reliability engineers and so forth. Think of it more like traditional ops is the way I think about it. Um, well, a lot of times there's a lot of larger organizations that these teams can earn the right to have somebody else run their service, okay? But they have to earn the right. So if I'm doing the rental cars and I deploy my service and it's a certain level of st stable and it does a certain level of whatever I want to measure for a certain amount of time, then the SRE team, e team will take it over. And now they'll be responsible for if there's a failure in the data center and they have to move things over or whatever. They don't just get to hand it over. Uh, but most likely they own it from idea, John Willis says idea to cha-ching. So I want to talk about platforms, our services for a second real quick, because segue. Clumsy segue, but segue nonetheless. <laughs> um, if you think about service offerings and what you can do to provide infrastructure for people, uh, I like to use this analogy of car as a service, although I keep forgetting to change that to on-premises because on-premise isn't a thing. But anyway, um, if I buy a car, I'm responsible for everything about that car. I have to finance it, I have to change the tires, I have to put the, the fuel in it, you know, everything about the car. Um, so think about that, that is on-premises. Lease a car, some of it gets taken over, hire a car, you know, et cetera. I'm a big fan when it comes to continuous delivery stuff as platform as a service, where, and I'm not necessarily saying pay Amazon, I'll get to that a little bit, but 
where we can make a platform available to these teams. Because again, we're not really going to have Solaris admins and DBAs and that kind of stuff on every team. So why am I a fan of that? An example um, from, the, from the US, uh, if you probably could tell by my accent. Um, there's an organization called cloud.gov. If you're a US government uh, organization, and as I understand that the regulations for Singapore are relatively similar, if you're a government organization and you want to run something on public cloud, there's a whole bunch of things you've got to make sure you're doing. Tests you have to do, compliance, et cetera. So cloud.gov was stood up. It's an official service of the US government. So government agencies below a certain risk factor can call up cloud.gov and they'll host their applications. And what they do is there's 325 required security controls total. Cloud.gov takes care of 269 of them. So some of these are around DNS and operating system patching and um, backup and recovery and those kinds of things. And so cloud.gov says, we'll do that. We'll take care of hard drives catching on fire because that happens. 41 of them are shared. They're, you know, it's the application responsible for part of it. Um, the, the, the platform's responsible for part of it. And 15 are handled by the customer. So if you're the one creating that service, if you're the one hiring out cars for the government, <laughs> um, you just went from having to do 325 things to doing, what, 15 and sharing 41. And so we can do these things for our teams to give them the ability to do all these deployments. Because spoiler alert, which I'll get to in a minute, we're really not going to have all the skills on every team. I fly a lot, a couple hundred thousand miles a year. Um, been up in the clouds and haven't seen a computer out there once. <laughs> okay. I mean, so there are real computers. They have power cords and hard drives and RAM and all of those things. And you can hire this out, but you don't have to. So when I say platform as a service, again, I'm not saying, OK, got to go hire Amazon. Got to go. And by the way, ThoughtWorks doesn't sell any platform stuff, so it's not a pitch. But when I say these things, I'm not saying you got to go do public cloud necessarily. You're going to do these things internally. <laughs> got to smile for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so if we go back to our product teams, um, it would be great if we had truly cross-functional teams. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks products, and our teams are. So Ganesh back there is a developer on GoCD. Everything about GoCD, from marketing to support, is on that team. And that's awesome. That's not not all organizations can do that. So one of the things you can do is something like this. So you might have people inside your organization that it's their responsibility to run Cloud Fusion, OpenStack, Kubernetes, Google Cloud, Amazon, whatever. So there's people inside the organization who do operation stuff as a living that still can run the platform. You are not going to have people with compliance expertise on every team. Um, but it's kind of an important thing. Uh, you're not going to have security people on every team. I wish we did. Um, and security should be front of your mind, but there might be these other teams. And so now, well, how does this play? So what I want to do now is take a look. These are our teams. This is our continuous delivery pipeline. What's their role? So in a CD pipeline, a lot of times what happens, and this is the dreaded linear pipeline, is the development team has their pipeline. It's unit tests and functional tests, and it's often in production. And this rightfully scares the heck out of some people. OK, uh, there's nothing stopping me from creating an application, putting a ThoughtWorks logo on it, deploying it to AWS, and people thinking it's a ThoughtWorks app that may or may not be in compliance with our privacy policies, that may or may not be secure. Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, I mean, I work for a, team, a company that makes a continuous delivery tool. This scares me. So some examples of why. Things that are bad. Deploying insecure software. We can all pretty much agree that's bad, right? Non-performance software. There's been study after study of you're, you know, X percentage slower than your competitor, you're going to leave. I am horrible. If your site's slow and I have an option, I'm gone. Okay, so we want to make sure we're testing these kinds of things all the time. Non-complying software. Um, do you all deal with GDPR here much? It's a Europe thing, but I see like all the cookie notices. Um, 
if we like collect the wrong information about somebody and don't have it in a way where we can easily delete it, we could be subject to millions of dollars in fines. And so we need to make sure our stuff's in compliance. We need to make sure we're not using old versions of OpenSSL or what have you. Ineffective software. Nobody tests this. We deployed a feature. Did our sales go up or down? Okay, we don't test this. We should. I hinted at this earlier, but a continuous delivery pipeline has one purpose, and that's to kill a release candidate. Every time you make a change, source code, configuration, whatever, you have created a release candidate. It's the continuous delivery server's job to kill it. It's a continuous delivery job's, server's job to prove it's not good enough to give to your customers. Okay? You can't prove something's good. You can't. You can't prove something's secure. Because there's things out there that just haven't been exploited yet or what have you. You can prove it's bad. And this is why you have to have all the tests and you actually have to run all the tests. So if we go back to our organization, what I would recommend you do in your pipelines is you have all the other things in there too. And there's tricks around this. Okay? So you know, we have our security team and our compliance team here. Um, this is a concept we call fan in, fan out. But I'm going to give the development team fast access to production. I'm not going to slow down their pipeline by sticking these things in the middle. Because I don't want to wait for a staging deployment until OWASP security tests are done. Okay, because we, I want to deploy the staging as often as possible because that's testing my deployment. I don't want to make a product owner wait to do user acceptance testing because some other kind of test isn't done. So this is why we do a lot of things in parallel. Now what you can do though is notice at the end, the arrows up to deploy production, those are not just theoretical, those should be enforced. So what you can do is, you know, the functional tests and deploy staging might run 47 times for every one time compliance test run. And that's okay, it ain't going to production if that build didn't pass all of them. So you can do these things. Uh, modern tools can all do this. I mean, I recommend GoCD because I helped create it, but you know, use yours. <laughs> um, I mean, they're, you can do these and you should. And these are just examples. This is compliance and security, but I mentioned performance and those kinds of things. And when I say it's not CD if you can't deploy right now, this is what I mean. I mean safely having run all of the tests. So it's an eye chart. I don't expect you to be able to read it, but that's a picture of a real pipeline. Okay, so it's not linear. You make a code change and it builds Linux and Windows in parallel. Linux gives us Mac and Solaris, so I don't need to do all those. If that all passes, then we do the plugins. If that passes, then we create an installers. If that passes, etc. Okay, but I can do these things in parallel. I don't have to wait for the Linux stuff to finish to do the Windows stuff. Uh, but also, um, if anybody cares, I carry this because I have a bad back. I'm not a Windows lover. But this one takes twice as long as this one. Surprise! Okay, so the Linux pipeline might run twice as fast, you know, two times for every once the Windows pipeline runs. Okay, but that's okay. If these parallel jobs were all in one pipeline, the whole thing wouldn't finish until Windows stuff. So the Linux build agents would be sitting there idle half the time. I want fast feedback. So if that means that they, they run out of sync, that's okay because we're going to enforce that they all have to pass before we go here. That's the idea behind parallel, is that every stage can give you the feedback in a very fast manner. So some deployment patterns. Um, first off, another thing out of the radar, separate in your mind the difference from, between deploy and release. Okay, deploy is put the software on the server. Release is make it available to the customer. So if my deploy process takes an hour and a half because I have 4,000 servers globally, I can deploy with the feature toggles turned off, for example, and when I'm ready to release, click a button and it turns on. Okay, so you can deploy constantly, but you don't release. Um, you know, again, GoCD is on-premises software. If we released as often as we build, you would be doing apt-get update three times a day and you'd get really, really angry. Okay, so we release it once a month, but we deploy it quite a bit more often than that. Um, just some other patterns. So people familiar with Canary releasing? This helps me know how much time to spend on these things. Okay, so there's a, um, 
a thing that's actually true, the canary in a coal mine. In the U.S., when they're mining coal years ago, they would take a bird into the coal mine with them, and if the bird died, they would leave. Because birds have very small lungs, and there was gases in the air that were going to kill them eventually. And so what a canary release is, is basically the same idea. I'm going to toggle on that feature for a subset of my employees. In this case, it's Facebook. So when they do a new feature, the toggle goes on where that feature becomes live only for Facebook employees. And so they can now test in production. They can see, is it still performant at production scale? Is it doing what we wanted it to do? Do people hate it? You know, et cetera. Um, if that works, then it goes to a larger set and a larger set and a larger set. Um, lots of different tools out there to do this. Um, containers make this a ton easier. Uh, but canary releasing is a great way to find out, am I going to sell more shoes with my new feature or not? So I put it out there. If I sell less shoes, I turn it off. Okay, we don't want to, we don't want business to go down. I love this one. Um, dark launching. So again, Facebook. Years ago, um, Facebook released the feature that allowed y'all to have a unique username. So you could go get, you know, the facebook.com slash whatever your name is, okay? For a long time, they didn't have that. They had like these random strings or what have you. So they're going to release this new feature. It was well publicized. Lots of people wanted it. But there's a problem. They're unique, and they're unique globally. And so I can't release this in a canary. I can't release this only to the US and let them grab up all their names, and then people in Singapore can't get theirs. OK, that's not fair. Um, and so I have to release this feature to everybody at once. And they already had tens of millions of customers. How do you test that? They did a thing called dark launching. What they did is they put JavaScript in the code where when you logged into Facebook, it made a call and tried to reserve a username for you, randomly generated. But it, got to, it did that, and so they got to see, OK, what did that do to our system? And they did it at you know, 6 PM or what have you, and, you know, in Pacific time where they are. But globally, all of a sudden, everybody, you know, canary, certain number, certain number, certain number, tested it, tested it, and tested it. Um, over and over and over, I've had to fix a whole bunch of things. When they went live, this chart, I recreated it. it you can see the real one on the thing. I recreated it because it was tiny image. This chart is the memcache. So, and all over the world, everybody got to reserve their username at the same time. And so if you have a relatively unique name like mine, it wasn't a big deal. But if you're you know, Tom Smith in the US, there's probably, no exaggeration, probably 5,000 of you. And if you want T. Smith, you had to race. And so everybody did. People were sitting by their keyboards. So you can do this. If there's a major shopping holiday coming up, a major anything else, what have you, you can do these things and test these features in production because you can't set up a testing environment at this scale. You just can't. OK, Knight Capital. Knight Capital was past tense. <laughs> uh, well, they're kind of still around. It was a trading firm. So what they did is they traded stock. They had a program called the Retail Liquidity. And they were manually deploying this. And there's a whole bunch of things that went wrong here. But they're manually deploying it. And the person responsible for it um, deployed it to seven of their servers. The problem is they had eight. I want to pause here and say I'm one of those people who believes there is no such thing as human error. It doesn't exist. The problem wasn't that the person didn't deploy it to the eighth server. The problem was they didn't have automation to prevent him from deploying it to the eighth server. Okay? That said, didn't deploy it to the eighth server. What this program did was offer to buy and sell stock at ridiculous prices to then simulate what would happen to the market. So stock's $10, it would offer 14 or 6 or you know, whatever, just to test what happened. And it was not really doing anything, but it was running and watching the real stock market, except for the eighth server was really doing it, because it wasn't turned off on that one. So they had 4 million stock executions, 397 million shares, in roughly the time it took me to do this talk, they lost $440 million. 
one automated script would have stopped this. <laughs> and a whole bunch of other things. I mean, it, like I said, it's, not, it's never just one thing. Um, but the point of the automation here, too, is to reduce your risk. Um, a lot of people think that, oh, if I only deploy every six months, that's less risk. No, it's more risk. Because now your deployment has six months worth of code in it. It's actually less risky to deploy more often. If they had deployed this in little bits and found the little problem, they probably wouldn't have got acquired the next day because their market cap was $420 million. Somebody just came in and liquidated the company. So, summary. The goal of continuous delivery is to make sure your software is always in a deployable state. Don't confuse continuous delivery with continuous deployment. Continuous delivery is I can deploy anytime I want. Continuous, de or continuous deployment is I do deploy anytime all the, pa the, the tests pass. I believe it's the same amount of testing either way. So all the things you do in continuous deployment, you should be doing continuous delivery, but it's a business decision of do I actually release to customers. It's possible org structure changes. Uh, we went and saw a client today, and they were saying, should I deploy GoCD this way or that way? And like, don't care. It doesn't matter to the product. What do you want to do from an organizational perspective? Um, they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, it's more likely this is where the issues are. If we really want to get development teams in contact with customers. Um, obviously, smaller pieces are easier to deliver. Please don't skip your security tests and compliance tests and so forth. I put my credit card online about nine times a day, and I don't want to go broke. Um, these things are important. Um, I'm not sure how the laws are here, but in the US, after some major failures, um, people in technical management positions can go to jail over this. If, if something goes out there and there's a security problem or a compliance problem and they lose a bunch of money, they lose stock value, and they'll come in and say, you didn't take their safeguards you should have taken, that a reasonable person would have taken, they go to jail. This is important. Who do you jail? The CIO? Sorry? Do you jail the CIO? The, could CIO, CTO, heads of development, yep. There was entire um, uh, retirement funds wiped out by a couple, WorldCom and a couple other massive failures, where they should have known these things were happening, but they didn't have any testing in place. So we have a rule, set of rules now called Sarbanes-Oxley that are serious. Sorry, question on that one. Yep. Does Starbucks cover people who are non-directors? Sarbanes-Oxley? Yeah. For the going to jail, no. It may not. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know who goes to jail, but people go to jail. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's usually people that, you know, should have had the, the oversight is my understanding. What their titles are, it's hard to say. Um, anyway, that's my story. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> so questions at all?